Good morning. Welcome to our webinar on single sign-on. I'm happy to introduce our expert, Damian Wyszkiewicz. Hello, Damian. My name is Aleksandra Borucka, and I am the moderator of this meeting. Let's start by sharing some essential organizational information about this session. Today's webinar is recorded and it will be available on our YouTube channel. You are invited to ask any questions. You can do it using the questions window on the top of the screen. Damian will answer all your questions depending on how much time we have. We will answer some questions during the presentation and others by email. During the session, we will also take two short breaks to ask you two short questions to learn about your situation in order to better address your needs. Now I will present a short introduction about the company and I will give the floor to Damian very soon. To begin with, a few words about us. As All for One Poland, we support our customers in four, in four main areas. Implementation and support services for SAP systems. Implementation and maintenance of cloud environments. Digitalization of processes and custom software development. Information security. At Enterprise Software House of All for One Poland, we design and develop custom software for the enterprise world. We focus on large, highly scalable custom systems which support the company's processes and interactions with customers and partners. As we all know, the issue of single sign-on is very important to corporate IT landscapes. That's why we are dedicating our webinar today to it. So I'm handing over the floor to our expert, Damian. Damian, it's your turn. Thank you for introducing me and hi, everyone. So today, let me start with a few words about what I will be talking about today. Okay. So we will start with a bit of a theory. So what is that thing called SSO? What are its benefits? And what tools can we use to introduce an SSO in our system? And Today we will focus on Keycloak because that's the platform I'm using and I have the most experience with. Uh, I will talk about some pros and cons of Keycloak, how can we integrate different types of applications with it. And then I will talk about access management, so authorization. So how can you let some users do more than other users? Then I will be talking about Keycloak system requirements and how can you manage its configuration between development and production environments. And lastly, I will present a demo with seamless SSO between multiple types of applications. And as our company is mostly about SAP, one of those applications will be SAP based. Uh, and I will use identity provided by Entra ID, before known as Azure Active Directory. Uh, so that will be a real life example of architecture that you can encounter in your projects. Uh, okay, and before we start, I would like to ask you a question uh, about your experience and knowledge with uh, single sign-on. So, uh, feel free to answer that question. Do you have daily experience with single sign-on and do you know what is it? And I will wait a, a minute to get the vote. Okay, most of you voted, so I will share the results. Uh, so, mm, most of you know what is SSO, but you don't encounter it but some of you don't know what SSO is, so I will try to explain that. Okay, so let me start with uh, the definition of SSO. So SSO stands for single and sign-on. So it's an authentication process that allows the user to access multiple applications or uh, services with one set of credentials. So basically, you log in only once and you log in 
everywhere in the same ecosystem. So you do not need to re-enter your credentials. Mm. And what are the benefits of using that solution? Uh, first and the most important one is improved security because if you have uh, less credentials to manage, there is a smaller risk of uh, your credentials being weak and by that your account being stolen and no one likes to have their account stolen. Uh, also, it centralizes access control, so it's easier for administrators to manage users when you have a single point where then they can do that instead of having some kind of user management in every application in this uh, ecosystem. Uh, it increases productivity because when people spend less time logging in, they have more time to do something productive. Uh, it enhances user experience because they have only one login screen, they log in once and they don't have to worry about logging in again when they use a different application in the ecosystem. Uh, it helps with scalability and flexibility because when an organization will adopt new application, uh, they won't need to care about uh, some user management panel, authentication or authorization, they will just integrate with SSO and everything will be there out of the box. Uh, and it reduces IT costs because when people have less passwords to manage, they don't forget passwords that often. So IT doesn't need to um, reset those passwords and uh, yeah. Okay, and what tools can we use to create an SSO solution? Mm, there are a lot of identity and access management platforms uh, on the market. Uh, those are just the examples, there are a lot of more of them. Uh, but today I will focus on Keycloak because as I said before, I have the most experience with it and I like it the most. Mm. Okay, so what is Keycloak? Uh, Keycloak is open source identity and access management solution developed by Red Hat. So it's open source, but mm, it's not some, some student project or something like that. There are big names behind it. Red Hat is, uh, is, is known for creating uh, Red Hat Enterprise Linux, for example, and its derivatives like CentOS or Rocky Linux. Mm. And what are pros and cons of Keycloak? So one uh, advantage of Keycloak is that it's open source, so community can view and modify its source code. Uh, it follows all the industry standards and protocols, OpenID Connect, uh, SAML2, and OAuth2. And uh, because of that, it's easy to integrate applications with, because it follows those standards and also Keycloak team provided some libraries and adapters for multiple languages and frameworks. So it should be very easy to integrate an application with Keycloak, no matter what, what technology you use. And also it has really user-friendly administration console, mainly because it's open source. So people like can suggest some changes, etc. And on the other hand, Keycloak may become some quite resource intensive if you have a lot of users in your system. Uh, and it has, because it's open source, it has quite limited official support. Uh, but there is a paid alternative called Red Hat SSO, which is based on Keycloak. So if official support is what you need, you can use Red Hat SSO instead of Keycloak. And now I will talk about what applications can you integrate with Keycloak. So basically all of the all of the web applications you can think of, uh, those are just the ad samples. I've added SAP because that's the most important types of applications for our company and it's uh, needed by the 
industry. Uh, yes, and basically you can uh, integrate applications that can use SAML or OpenID Connects protocols to authenticate and authorize. Uh, I won't go too deep into details about those protocols, but basically both allow to authenticate users and send user data from authorization provider, so Kitlock, to an application. Uh, SAML is a bit older and it uses XML to, to communicate with application, but it's more secure uh, and but a little less performant on the other side. And OpenID Connect uses uh, JSON web tokens. It's newer, easier to use, and more performance and mm, in normal use cases, you should probably use OpenID Connect, but if you have something that you need to be very, very secure, it's better to use SAML. Uh, and most frameworks offer libraries uh, or modules for both of those protocols, so you can basically choose. Uh, okay, so how do we integrate an SAP ABAP application uh, with Kitlock? Mm. So it's really straightforward. We only need to go to SAML to transaction code and configure ABAP system as SAML service provider. It's uh, basically you just put in a name you want it to have and just leave all on defaults and it should work just fine. Uh, then you export metadata from that, uh, from that screen into Kitlock. It's in XML format. And you do the same on the Kitlock side. So you export meta metadata and import into uh, ABAP system as trusted provider. Uh, and voila, it's it's all of that. So and you have a subsystem integrated with your SSO. So in five minutes you can do that probably. Uh, and how can we integrate backend application with uh, Kitlock? I will be talking based on Spring security uh, because that's what we use the most. But as I said, there are libraries for already modern and used uh, languages and framework. I know there is a Go uh, OpenID Connect client. There is something for Node.js. Uh, yeah, so um, you can configure your application um, to work in two ways. It can act as OAuth to client. OAuth to client means that application will uh, authenticate with users. So you go to that application, you are redirected to login screen, and uh, the token is recognized to return to application. But also, um, if you have a microservice architecture um, and your application uh, is only working as an REST API for some other application, uh, then you can configure it to be a OAuth 2 resource server. So it won't um, allow users to um, authenticate using that normal redirection to login screen flow. It will only verify tokens sent from other applications. Um, yes. and. If you have that microservice architecture, then you would need to authenticate your front-end application, probably written in JavaScript. Uh, yes, but it's mm, authenticating a front-end application is a little bit less safe than authenticating back-end application, because on front-end you can't store a client secret in a secure way. So those applications won't have client secret, and by that it's it's a little less safe. Uh, but it's there are a lot of libraries for JavaScript to integrate with Kitlock. You can use the one provided by Kitlock team itself, uh, so Kitlock JS. But as I said before, uh, Kitlock follows OpenID Connect standard, so you can use uh, some different library that's used not specifically specifically for Kitlock, but for OpenID Connect, like OpenID Connect client.js. Uh, 
and there are a lot of more of them, but those should be enough. Mm, yes, and what about user management? Uh, so you can create users in Gitlog's admin panel, but in production environment, that probably won't be enough because you would like to use identity provided by some external source like Google, Facebook, LinkedIn, or some other social sites, or uh, different identity providers like Azure Active Directory. Uh, so on the screenshot, you can see there is a quite a big list of those supported social systems. And also you can configure your own identity provider uh, if it uses OpenID Connect or SAML protocol. And if that's not enough, and you still use Kerberos or uh, Active Directory with LDAP, uh, then you can also configure uh, user federation. So synchronizing users between your Active Directory and, uh, and GitLab. Uh, so yeah, so basically you should be able to, to get your users from everywhere you, you would like to. Mm, okay, and I was talking about authentication. Now I will talk a little about uh, authorization. So not who the user is, but what can he do? Uh, and there are quite a lot of um, ways you can authorize users to do something. The most simple one is role-based access control. So basically, you can set a role for the user in your application. And as you can see on that example, if I am if I have the, an admin role, then I can click that button. And I if I don't have that role, I cannot click that, click that. So it's like the most simple access control mechanism. Uh, and you can grant multiple roles to users and they can be composite. So um, if, for example, I am granting a user admin role, he also receives user role by default because user role depends on admin role. Uh, yeah. And also you can organize users um, with similar roles or attributes to groups. Uh, and groups are in uh, three structure. So as you can see, I have an administrators group that has child groups, global administrators and moderators. So that allows you to have a lot of control over how you want to manage users and organize them. Uh, and it allows you to grant your roles and attributes not only to individual users, but also to the group as a whole. So it lets you to manage users easier than, than managing them individually. Uh, yes, and you can um, authorize users based on roles assigned to those groups or attributes. But also you can um, create a structures like uh, organizations. When when you have users from multiple organizations, you can map them uh, to those groups. And then in your application, you are able to verify if someone has access to something based on that, if he um, is a member of an organization. So that's really helpful for big applications and some kind of multi-tenancy. Uh, but if that's still not enough for you, there is something called GitLog authorization services. Uh, and it's uh, fine-grained um, authorization. So it um, lets you to grant user accesses not only to the whole application and not only grant them roles or attributes, but also grant them access to some specific API endpoints. And um, it gives you a lot of control because um, you can 
create policies that will grant users permissions based on their attributes, their roles, the groups they are a member uh, to in. Uh, you can grant access to some specific API endpoints to specific users, or even you can grant an access based on uh, time. So for example, you can grant user access for one hour only, and you can aggregate all of those types. So we can create something like grant user A access to admin endpoint with scope read only for only an hour. So this is, you have like full control over your resources and use what users can access. Uh, okay, now I will go into a bit of configuration side of Kitlock. Mm. So more technical side. Uh, so those are the minimal requirements to run Kitlock instance. So we need a half gigabyte of RAM, one gigabyte of disk space, and some external database where we'll be stored users, groups, and all those things that I've shown before that you can manage. Uh, but of course, those are just minimal system requirements. Uh, if you have a lot more users, as I said on at the beginning, uh, it can it can become quite resource intensive. Uh, but yeah, but if you have some development server, for example, it should easily run on some T1 micro AWS EC2 instances or some B2s in uh, Azure. Uh, yes, and you can scale those instances vertically, so grant more resources to them. But also, Kitlock is very easy to scale horizontally, so create more instances of it. Uh, and yes, so it helps with stability, scalability, because uh, you can easily create new and new instances if you have more users and split workload between them. Uh, and it also helps with uh, high availability because um, you have basically no downtimes. If one server goes down, then you have the other ones that take his, his role. Uh, yeah. Mm. And there is also mm, a case mm, because you can manage Kitlock's configuration using that very user friendly uh, admin panel. But mm, in bigger projects and in some production mm, environments, that won't be enough because probably you will have, mm, you want to have your configuration as a code. You want to have it, uh, it versioned and probably want to have that in some kind of CI CD pipeline and without downtimes to don't disturb our user, users. Uh, so there is some utility called Kitlock config CLI, and it allows you to do that. Basically, you can store a whole Kitlock configuration in JSON or YAML file format and uh, change and apply that configuration on your server without any downtime. So. It's very helpful and, and, and yeah, I like it a lot. And one of the biggest benefits of Kitlock is that it's very customizable. It allows you to plug in your custom code to it. Uh, and you need to use Java because Kitlock is written in Java. Uh, but yes, but it allows you to, to, to use some of your custom code if you have some non-standard requirements and you can use that to write your custom authenticators. So like mm, steps in your, in the flow that users will use while authenticating. So for example, you have like, that's quite standard requirement. So you want users to mm, first only enter their email without password and based on that email to redirect to specific identity provider. So for example, if user has 
email with domain a.com, you want him to be redirected automatically to uh, a.com identity provider, and if B, the same for B, uh, then you can do that. You can write your custom code and change the whole flow of authentication if it's really customizable. Mm, you can also write some custom user storage providers. Mm, it's very helpful when you're migra migrating your current system to SSO and you don't want yet to just copy, export and import all your users and everything into Kitlog and you want them uh, to have in, in your own database you are currently using. Or you just have some non-standard protocol and you cannot by default like connect those user repositories with Kitlog, uh, then you can write some custom code and it's easy and there are a lot of tutorials on the internet how to do that. So that should be very straightforward and it's yeah, it's it's nice because it's, it gives you a lot of flexibility. Mm, custom protocol mappers. Yes, so protocol mappers are things that allows allow to mm, put some custom user attributes into token based on specific needs. So for example, you can have a case where you want to grant an user a role based on his age, for example. So you have an adult and underage role and you want it to be granted based on his age attribute. So that's not mm, by default supported by Kitler, but you can write your own protocol mapper and, and have that. And custom themes. So that's something that mm, probably everyone will use because and by two custom themes, you can create your own login screen uh, with your branding or, or to match your user experience requirements. Uh, so, so yes, to, so you won't need to use default Skipshot login screen, but you can use your own. Uh, and to sum everything up, um, it's really beneficial to have an SSO uh, solution in your company because it will reduce your IT costs, simplify user management. Uh, it will increase, increase your productivity because you will be able to access multiple applications with a single login and you won't have all those login streams. And it will enhance security because you will have only one point of, of users and authentications. So you can make it very secure, have multi-factor multi authentication, for example, which is also provided by default by Kitlog. Brute force uh, mitigation, it's also by default. Yes. So yeah, so it's very secure and it follows standards and it's mm, tested. So, so it's better to use some standard solution than your own. Uh, okay, so now I will ask you to answer the second question. Mm. So have you recently encountered a system that did not have a single sign-on? So you had a lot of login streams. Uh, yeah, so you are using a lot of applications from the same ecosystem and you needed to put your login credentials in all of them. So if yes, answer yes, and if no, no. Okay, thank you very much. Yes, so single sign-on is becoming an industry standard, so most of the companies should probably start using it because it's, as I said, it's really beneficial. And, and yeah, so thank you for your input. Uh, so now I will show a simple demo of how um, can a real life production example look like? So you want, you have a system where you have some SAP based application. Uh, you have some Spring Boot application that Spring Boot service that works as a resource server. So it only gives an API 
and you have application written in React, so front-end application that will communicate with that Spring Boot application. Uh, and you want to be able to move between those applications without re-entering your credentials. And uh, also, I will use identity provisioned by uh, Azure Active Directory. So like some real life example that you can encounter in your work. Uh, oh, sorry. Let me share that video. Okay. So as you can see, I'm I'm entering a web GUI of uh, my SAP system, and instead of showing me the login screen of um, SAP, it instantly redirected me to Hitler's login screen, and there I can log in using my credentials of a user in created by Hitler's admin panel if an administrator created that for me, but also I can use uh, log in with Azure Active Directory button. So that's what I will do. Uh, you can have um, a list of those 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 buttons like Google, like Facebook. Mm, yeah, so I'm getting redirected to um, Microsoft login screen, my Azure Active Directory. I'm logging in with my Microsoft credentials. So Keycloud doesn't receive those credentials, so it's really safe. It's only Microsoft only tells Keycloud that I'm authenticated and it doesn't need to re-authenticate me, but credentials aren't sent. I'm logging in and as you can see, I logged into SAP Web GUI using my Microsoft account. I'm logged in and everything is fine, uh, but that's not the main use of that SSO. Now I will switch to uh, front-end application written in React. And as you can see, there wasn't any login screen. It's just instantly locked me in and I'm locked in as the same user that I was logged in in SAP. Uh, and also I will call Spring Boot microservice. Mm. Yes, and the response is is uh, is returned from that service, and as you can see there, I'm also logged in as the same user, so everything worked as expected. I have only one login screen, and I can switch between mm, multiple applications without user seeing anything. Uh, yeah, so that's what I wanted to show. So I will go back to my presentation. Uh, yes, so if you have any questions, uh, feel free to ask them. I've seen there are some of them. And so, uh, what about monitoring? How do we monitor the availability of Keycloak? Uh, yes, so Keycloak um, by default allows you to um, enable health checks. So you have a health endpoint that you can call in some intervals, for example, using heartbeat tool from Elasticsearch stack. Uh, yeah, so if Kitlock will be down, then you will know about it because that health endpoint will uh, return some error and tell you it's down. And also if you have clustered Kitlock, then you have multiple instances and probably you won't even see that one instance is down because um, users will be by default by load balancer load will be moved to another instance uh, in case i have many users in the project what do you recommend to pay attention on how to man maintain such a big system without downtimes mm. Yes, so as I thought, the best idea is probably to have multiple keycloud instances clustered because then mm, load will be split between those instances and you want, mm, like, you have a lot more resources to work with. And mm, even if, if one will go down because 
because something then then the other one will still work so so probably clustering will be will be the solution for a big big system uh, yes so so those were um, all the questions so thank you for your input and thank you for uh, listening to my presentation mm. Yes, so thank you very much. Uh, Damian, thank you very much for your presentation and thank you all for your participation. Uh, the webinar will be available on our website and our YouTube channel. And I encourage you also to watch our other webinars and register for the upcoming ones. If you have any questions related to single sign-on or other all-for-one solutions and competencies, please contact us. Thank you very much. Goodbye and see you. Thank you. Bye.